A small town police officer is called to investigate a strange occurrence out in the middle of nowhere. Along with his colleagues, they find a mysterious hidden tunnel, which in itself poses more questions than it answers. Ah, oh, my dear friends, another little treat for you on this beautiful Monday evening. Yet another story from Mr. Outlaw, and this one is intriguing, mysterious, and downright weird. Special shout out to all of you doing the night shift, as ever. I hope this brings you a bit of relief in your hours of boredom. So, are you ready? Time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, if you can have one. And listen. Well, I suppose found isn't exactly the right word. It's a bit complicated. You'll see what I mean. I'm a cop based in eastern Nevada. Been one for about 12 years. Experienced a lot of things during that period that I could have gone lifetimes without. But, well, everything that I've seen up to this point, as sick and twisted as they might have been, at least they've made some kind of sense or yielded some kind of logical conclusion. But this, I just don't know. The call came through late at night. A panic-sounding man was breathing heavily into the phone, saying something along the lines of, We need help. It's out. They let it out. It was hard to say for sure. He was barely coherent. After a few minutes... The line goes dead. We trace the call to a small shack in the middle of a forest on the other side of town. We found a cell phone that looked like it had been smashed, lying in the grass a few feet away from the entrance. And no man. We go into the shack and search around, but find nothing but a small stool. We scope the place inside out, but there seemed to be nothing. Eventually one of my partners... 240 pound beefcake named Jeff plopped down onto the stool in frustration. As soon as he did this, the entire floor under it gave way. He didn't fall too far, thankfully. Only about four meters. But he'd uncovered something truly bizarre. It was a man made tunnel, undergoing the standard protocol and taking extreme precautions. We jumped down. Here was the disconcerting part. The tunnel went both ways. In other words, this was not the starting point. We decided to send four guys one way and three the other. I was part of the three that went backwards from where we'd initially broken through. From the illumination of the flashlights, the tunnel seemed to be pretty barren. Rough, muddy walls and ceilings, along with wooden supports about every half meter. It got me thinking. Who the hell would go through the process of making this place? Eventually, we came across what appears to be a ladder descending further downwards. I could sense the hesitation in the air. This was not what we'd expected. We all stood there for a second, not wanting to admit to each other that we really didn't want to go down there. But then... We heard the scream. Ear piercing. It wasn't faint, nor was it distant. It sounded like it was coming from only a few meters below us. Fueled by a sudden adrenaline rush, I decided to go down first. The climb was short, only taking me about 15 seconds. I found myself in what I can only describe as a small computer lab. Dirty concrete floors and walls. But there were four monitors, all displaying an error screen, all hooked up to what I thought was some kind of power source. But, well, I can't say for sure. I never was a computer guy. Actually, not all of them had the error screen. One out of the four had his screen smashed to bits. Suddenly, we heard another scream. We turned our attention to a half-open door in the far corner of the room. For a brief moment, I saw a dark, shadowy figure move past. The screaming stopped as abruptly as it started. 
being replaced by the sounds of something dragging on the floor. We barged into the room, guns drawn. But, well, it was about half the size of a closet, and there was nothing there. Well, not nothing. There was another tunnel, smaller and a lot cruder than the one we first entered. It led straight vertically down. We shone our flashlights through it, but were met with only black. Safe to say, we didn't pursue whatever had presumably just gone down there. We were all beyond petrified. I could hear hearts beating and rapid, scattered breaths as we sprinted back out and up into the shack again. When we did, we were alone. We waited in stunned horror for the other officers to come back out, but they never did. I know that cops are supposed to be the bravest of the brave, but well, at that moment, we simply couldn't move. Eventually, we just called it in. Backup arrived, and we told them what had happened. Their collective faces morphed into one of abject confusion. But I could tell that they were horrified just listening to our accounts. I decided to take a break from work. They allowed it. In fact, they never even followed up and told me what had happened. At the time, I just thought that was a good thing. But I could never sleep. It's not even that I was having nightmares. I was just too terrified to let my brain rest. Even with my wife lying at my side, I still felt a vague, perpetual sensation of danger. I needed some kind of closure. I decided to go into the station and ask around myself. I knocked on the captain's door and he let me in. The first thing that I saw when I entered was his expression. I'd never seen him look so terrified before. You want to know what happened, don't you? I nod. He lets out a dry, humorless laugh. <sighs> well, I don't know, was his response. He stopped speaking after that. Instead, simply staring at me in silence for about a minute before I finally decided to leave. I was too shaken by this to discuss the issue with anybody else. That encounter certainly didn't help my case. I went back home and sat on my couch, going through marathons upon marathons of every comedy movie I could find on Netflix. This helped, but only a little. And then I got a text from Jeff. Come see this right now. I could only assume it had to do with that room. I thought about it for a few hours before finally making my way over to his apartment. Yes, I needed some kind of closure. I needed to take any chance of finding it. As soon as he invited me in, I noticed that he had the same look of indistinct dread that the captain had had. But he was a little more willing to talk. After a quick and somewhat reserved hello, he gestured to a laptop sitting on a table behind him. What the hell is that? I asked him. He lets out a long exhale before answering. Recovered from that room in the tunnel. I thought back to the time that we were down there. I did remember seeing a laptop on one of the tables. I guess this was it. How do you have it? was my follow-up question. This time, his response was simple. I just took it. Why? He looks away for a second, his demeanor turning contemplative. But something's got to make sense here. Something that they're not telling us. Silently, I agree. I asked him what he found on it. Five video files, he says. Or five to ten minutes long. Have you watched them yet? Only one. Things making more sense? He shakes his head before sighing. No, but I think you should see it anyway. 
He leaves the room to grab me a cup of coffee before sitting back down at the table. I open up the video folder and see the names of the five clips. Train to Oblivion. Investigation. Fireworks. Triangle. And the Obscure Man. Watch Train to Oblivion, Jeff says. I take a few moments to think about it before ultimately obliging. This is better than nothing, I thought to myself. I press play. This is what I saw. It starts out with what I assume is handheld footage. As expected, we were on a train. However, there was something immediately wrong. The person behind the camera, it sounded like a woman, was near hyperventilating. She was running down a narrow aisle, while lights flickered above her. In addition to that, it looked as if they were in a tunnel, with the windows only showing darkness. As she ran, she kept opening the cabin doors and peering inside. Every one of them had people. Lifeless people with the limp faces contorted into inhuman expressions. Mouths stretched way out too far, eyes sunken inwards, and noses turned completely sideways. At some point, she tries opening a door, but it seems to be locked. We hear hushed whispering coming from behind it, as she starts banging on it, begging to be let in. This is interrupted by heavy footsteps coming from somewhere to her side. She quickly turns her head, facing what looks like three extremely tall figures about 50 meters away. She shrieks and starts running again. The video goes on like this for a while, her just sprinting around the tight space and screaming, while we see intermittent glimpses of the figures following her. However, it wasn't until the end where we got a good look at them. She finds a bathroom and runs into it locking it from the inside. She sits there, whimpering for a while before the door starts rattling. Her screams become deafening as it finally breaks down. I nearly scream myself when I see what did it. Tall, pale things wearing what looked like dirty suits, but it was their faces that really got me. I don't even think I can call them faces, in all honesty. They were just swirls of skin, if that makes any sense. Like a pale vortex of flesh. One of them reaches out a bony hand and grabs the woman's wrist. A brief struggle ensues that ends with us facing the mirror. The woman's face was now twisted into the same horrendous expressions that we'd seen on countless other passengers just before. We hear a loud horn blare before the video finally ends. But, well, here's the weird part. Not that all of this hasn't been weird so far. This just added another level of horror onto what we'd already experienced. In the mirror's reflection, there was no indication that the woman was holding anything to film with. No camera, no phone, nothing. In fact, her hands were down to her sides, and the creatures sure as hell weren't filming. I remained in downright silence for what felt like an hour after watching this. Jeff said nothing, just stared at me. I didn't know what to make of this. Eventually, I decided to get up and leave. Jeff didn't protest. I'm back home now. There's no clear solution here. It's obvious that my sleeping woes aren't going to end. Not until I figure something out. But that seems like a daunting task. And one that I don't think I'm prepared to handle right now. I think that the best course of action may be to go back and watch the rest of the videos. Surely there's some clue as to what happened within them. However... One thing is pushing me away from that decision. As I was getting ready to leave Jeff's, I saw something out of his kitchen window. 
there was a figure standing behind a street sign. Actually, it was barely a figure at all. It looked more like some kind of shadow. I think he was looking right at me. Well, all right. A lot of shit's happened since last time. Nothing I would consider good, though. For simplicity, I'll split them into what I would consider three distinct developments. One, the ongoing investigation. Two, weird shit happening with Jeff. And three, the other videos. Oh, here goes nothing. Regarding the investigation, the rabbit hole just keeps getting bigger and I don't anticipate finding any way out any time soon. I've been keeping in contact with one of my buddies, Colt, an officer who's been working on this, but the things he's telling me, I can't make sense of them. Apparently, the officers that went missing were simply never found. Colt and his team went down the other branch of the tunnel to search, obviously, and what they found made half of the guys quit right then and there. They came across a crudely dug hole, maybe three meters. Supposedly, it appeared so abruptly that he nearly fell in himself. Well, it's pretty obvious what happened, right? But here's where shit starts getting bizarre again. They tried illuminating the thing, but no matter how much and how strong the lights that they used were, it simply wouldn't penetrate the darkness. At one point, they started thinking that it was just some kind of black substance staining the ground. And when they tested it by dropping down coins, they went through. And they never made a sound. It was a hole indeed, and one that didn't seem to end. But the insanity-inducing shit didn't end there. No. Allegedly... There were dusty footprints on the other side. So, at least some of them didn't fall in. They created a makeshift path over the hole, attempting to get through. The guy who went over first, their superior, walked for about five seconds before freezing. He seemed to be looking at something. Out of nowhere, he flipped shit and scrambled back to the side they'd come from. Before they could stop him, he destroyed the path. That's a fucking dead end, was all that he said before basically sprinting away. Everybody was so stunned by this that they simply followed suit. He was supposed to be giving the orders, after all. After that, he demanded a transfer. When that was denied, he simply quit. He never told anyone what he actually saw. And nobody's gone down there since. However, Colt's been hearing rumours. Supposedly, government agents have been popping in and out of the station, asking obscure questions. They may have already gone down there, farther than Colt and his team did, but he doesn't know. Well, that's where the investigation stands at the moment. No questions answered but a fuck ton more needing to be asked. As for Jeff, I have no idea. Implicitly, I knew it had something to do with the shadow figure that I saw. I just didn't want it to. I decided that watching the other videos was the only opportunity I had to scrape together any kind of answer. But when I went over to his place and prepared to knock, his door was already halfway open. I put up my guard, moving painfully slow. I grabbed my pistol and made my way in. I swept the place, preparing myself for anything. But there was nothing. The only place that I couldn't get into was Jeff's bedroom. It was locked. Well, actually, I think it might have been barricaded shut. I knocked and knocked, all the while calling out and telling him that it was me. But he never answered. 
I knew that he was there, though. I could hear somebody moving around. It was fruitless, though. I considered simply breaking the door down, but that could have been disastrous. I didn't know where Jeff's mental state was. There was a chance that doing this would get my torso blown off. Nevertheless, the laptop was still open, sitting on his kitchen counter. And here's where the other videos come in. Well, well, only one of them actually. You'll see why. I was feeling paranoid as hell, so I made sure that I had my back to a wall and a clear view of every entrance and hallway in front of me. I also didn't let go of my gun. After telling myself to calm down, I clicked on the next video. Investigation. Just like Train to Oblivion, it started out shaky as hell. It remained frenetic, both sights and sounds, for about a minute. When it finally focused, it became obvious that we were in front of what looked like a decrepit apartment building. It panned around, revealing a multitude of police cars, piercing the night with their red and blue lights. But there were also SWAT vans. It also became evident that this was actual filmed footage, unlike Train to Oblivion. I still don't know how that was possible. The camera turned to face a man in SWAT gear, who nodded. It's on there? Yeah, yeah, I think so, the man behind the camera responds. I assume that it must have been mounted on his helmet or something. Why the fuck do we have to film this? he asks. The other SWAT shrugs his shoulders. I don't make the fucking rules. Right after he says this, there was a distortion in the frame. Things became buggy for a second, before the video seemed to cut to a point where they were already in the building. The place looked like hell. Dirty walls and floors inside a decaying foundation. I couldn't imagine that it was a place anyone actually lived in. There were about seven of them, all climbing the stairwell. There was also a sound coming from nowhere obvious, although the source must have been one of the top floors. Oh, and that fucking sound. It's hard to even describe. Like some kind of high-pitched croaking, if you can even imagine that. Climbing goes on for a few minutes, before one of those distortion cuts happen again. This time, they were in a hallway, standing in front of a door. The croaking sound was deafening at this point. Something big must have happened between the cuts, because there were only four of them now. One of them was even missing a hand. The man with the camera was desperately pounding and kicking at the door. But no matter how hard he tried, it simply wouldn't budge. Eventually, one of the other guys started screaming at the top of his lungs in what sounded like sheer frustration. He stood back, inserting an M203 into his rifle attachment. Everybody else followed suit and got out of the way. The video distorts again, just as he's about to launch it. When we cut back, the man was on his knees, weeping erratically. The croaking was also still there, loud as ever. The camera pans and we see the door. Despite evident signs of an explosion taking place, it's still fully intact. The last few seconds of the clip consisted of something breaking through the ceiling. An awfully long, dark red arm reaches down and picks up the weeping man, pulling him upwards. That's where it ended. I barely noticed the cold sweat dripping down my forehead. What the fuck was this? I got up and paced around, contemplating whether or not to stay. Whether or not I was ready to keep watching. I really didn't want to. Inexplicably though, it felt like I had to. But as it turns out, that decision wasn't up to me. I heard a very loud bang coming from Jeff's door only a few moments later. It was coming from the inside. I went over to take a look, but before I could even call out Jeff's name, another bang came through. This time, it made a crack, 
Another bang, and there was a hole. For a brief moment, I caught a glimpse of what had made it. And then, oh, I got the fuck out of there. I suppose that you could call it a void with some kind of a form. A solid shadow in the shape of a man. I would have been perfectly okay with not finding out anything more. But again, I don't think that decision's up to me. I took the laptop, but I don't know what that means for me. Like I said, I'm not getting out of this any time soon. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?